Well, today's subject is the continuation of the subject we've been talking about this whole week. It might not seem like it, but today's talk is the, it's the consummation of practically everything we've talked about. What I'm going to talk about isn't anything I've ever discussed before. How many of you in our Adventist denomination have heard, have heard about the idea of 6,000 years of history and then the end will come? Just one, two, three people? Okay. Did you know that many years ago, when people came into the church for the first time, they were usually taught that there would be 6,000 years of history, Christ would return, and then there would be the millennium. In all, that would make 7,000 years. Seven, that's the number of perfection. But now that the years have gone by, uh, unfortunately, these concepts have practically disappeared from the churches. If, if you ask anyone who, who's been around for the past 20 years, more or less, they don't know anything about this concept unless they've read something on their own. As a rule, they haven't heard anything about this preached from pulpits. We could probably even go back 30 years and people also wouldn't know anything about this subject. We might need to go back 35 or 40 years to find people who remember when these things were discussed openly. It's, and sadly, although these ideas have been part of the history of our denomination, the, the whole thing has been watered down now. And moreover, if one talks about this subject now, there are pastors, and there are even uh, pastors who have their sermons posted on the internet where they try to completely discredit the idea of 6,000 years and the return of Christ. Throughout this time that we've been presenting this subject as part of our fourth angel ministry, the, the conferences on whether there's a date for Christ's return, we've been able to expound on a lot of historical information that belongs to the Adventist Church and which we'll go over some today. But not just, not just those of the Adventist Church, we'll review some of the history that goes beyond the Adventist Church. We've, we've already given so much information, but today I'll summarize them a bit, as far as I can, so that we now see in, in broad strokes what the history behind the 6,000 years is. Where does this concept originate? Is it true? Is it right? You know what? When I started presenting this subject quite a long time ago, I didn't know anything about Mr. J. N. Andrews, an Adventist pioneer who lived in the same time as Ellen White herself. He wrote about the six and seven thousand years. When, when I discovered a few quotes by him in his writings on the subject, I was quite surprised. I'd never heard of him before. I did know that Ellen White had written on the subject, but right before I came here to the United States, some, someone showed me some information about Andrews. It motivated me to look up the original source in English. I had the privilege, thank God, to, to find in an edition of the Review and Herald from a long time ago, a series of articles, obviously they were written in English by Mr. Andrews. In those writings, he was delving deeply into this subject, much more so than many people could even imagine. Uh, unfortunately, as I've presented these subjects, I've received letters and emails and, and more from many people and from many Adventists. And I mean Adventists who are leaders of churches. And they say, 6,000 years? 
That's never been taught in our churches. It's all false. It's lies. You made it all up. You, you're trying to lead the people of God astray. Well, I'll tell you, I'm really sorry for how ignorant these people are. But despite this ignorance, these things can be demonstrated, and they don't want to see it anyway. It's really just willful ignorance. As Hosea says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And how is that? Is it that they didn't know? No, it says, for having rejected knowledge. In other words, the people were offered knowledge and they said, mm, I don't think so. I prefer to keep believing what I believe and the rest is just fairy tales. Well, I'll tell you one thing. One day they're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of God. We'll see if they tell him the same things they tell me. Just before I came, a brother from our church, a young guy, he translated for me all of J. N. Andrew's writings that appear in the Review and Herald that have to do with the six and 7,000 years. Thanks to him, I can show you them here. I'm not going to read it, all of it to you because it's very long. What I'll do is point out a few details. Well, here we are, thanks to Jose Amador. He, he's the one who translated these texts. And we'll see in the, the midst of the text, there's some words in bold type. Their comments that he inserted to show something surprising or something he's noticed. Uh, so I didn't want to delete those comments from the text. They're the reactions of a person who translated it. I, I think it's reasonable to include them. Hmm, take a gander at how the text begins. The great week of time. What is a week? Seven days, right? So what's the great week of time? You would think that it means something that goes beyond that. It must be much longer if it's a great week. Let's see what it says. Let's see what he himself says. The great week of time, or the period of seven years consecrated to the testing and judgment of humanity. Well, check it out. It turns out that Victor San Vicente is saying the same things as, as Andrew was saying many, many years before I was even born. I just want... I just want everyone to understand that I'm not making up anything new. I'm simply sharing something that the completely reliable Adventist pioneers believed in. And this is it. Here, here's the first article, the Review and Herald from July 17, 1883. Uh, how many years ago was that? Well, you can see, you can see it for yourself. Look how it starts. The day of judgment was appointed before the creation of our world. It was appointed before the rebellion of Satan and his angels. For when they had sinned, they were not immediately judged and consigned to punishment, but were reserved to the day of judgment to be punished. And he cites Jude 6 and 2 Peter 2, 4. It is evident, therefore, that when God created the angels, he appointed the day of judgment. It was necessary that such a day should be appointed when God first created intelligent beings. The angels, although they were innocent, were placed upon probation. And when that probation should end, the case must be decided whether they had been faithful or unfaithful in the trial through which they had passed. A day of judgment must therefore have been appointed to mark the close of their period of probation. And it's evidently for this reason that they were not punished as soon as they had sinned, but have been allowed to go on in sin and will be, be allowed thus to go on during all the period which must elapse between, before the day of judgment. Okay, do we accept what's being said? We do, don't we? The day of judgment must therefore have been appointed as early as the creation of the angels for they have been made amenable to it. Otherwise, they could not have been reserved to its decision before being punished. But the angels were in existence when God created our earth. 
That's in Job 38, 4 through 7. And therefore, the day of judgment was appointed before the creation of our earth and of the human race. And so, the day of judgment, being fixed before the sin of man, comes neither earlier nor later in consequence of that sin. Well, that's logical. God knows everything in advance. He had foreseen everything, and he pre-established it. When God created man, he, he placed him upon probation as he had previously placed the angels. After a brief period, man sinned against God and brought upon himself the sentence of death. But because there were some mitigating circumstances in the case of Adam, for he did not sin against so great light as did the angels, God saw fit to give to man a second probation, a mercy which was not extended to the angels. We know that this second probation of the human race will end at the day of judgment so that man will be judged at the time originally appointed for the judgment of the angels. And we have reason to believe that if the human race had not sinned against God, the probation under which man was first placed would, would have terminated at the same time as his second probation will terminate, namely, at the day of judgment. His first probation was to determine the question whether he would be faithful to God in preserving his innocence. His second probation is under circumstances that are much more difficult, for he must recover his lost innocence and in the same trial must prove his, prove his fidelity. When God created our earth, he, he indicated the period of time which must elapse before the day of judgment. Okay, get ready. Now we're going to hear the heart of the matter. He employed six days in the work of creation. On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. He sanctified the seventh day to be an everlasting memorial of the work of creation. But it appears that God designed by the first seven days of time to indicate the period assigned to the probation and judgment of mankind. Well, how did Andrews reach this conclusion? Was he just making it up? He's telling us that creation took place in six days and there was a seventh for rest because that reflected itself that's on how much, a much grander scale. A thousand days is like a year, perhaps. Let's look. St. Peter says that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That's 2 Peter 3.8. That's why when he says we, who, who is he referring to? To the Adventists, of course. Because we think, he didn't simply that the day of judgment would occupy a period of a thousand years, though this fact seems to be revealed in Revelation 20. That's the well-known millennium. In what is said of the two resurrections. But we think St. Peter also signified it by that the period devoted to the history of man before the day of judgment was also indicated by the days that God employed in the work of creation. So, what conclusion did Andrews reach? That obviously, creation has to do with one day is as a thousand years. That's the context this passage is found in according to none other than, than the Apostle Peter himself. Well, we think for, therefore that at the end of the 6,000 years from the creation, the day of judgment will commence. And, at, and that day will last for the period of 1,000 years. Well, check that out. 6,000 years from the start of creation, and then what will happen? The day of judgment will begin, and it'll last for a period of 1,000 years. What do you think about that? Was Andrews imagining all of this? Was he just making it up? He was basing what he wrote on a series of biblical texts. Well, okay, L look, he continues. Thus, we have for the probation and judgment of mankind a great week of time, the period of 7,000 years. This period commenced at creation when God spoke the word which called the elements into existence and it will end with the destruction of the wicked in the lake of fire. Then God will create new heavens and new earth, etc., etc., etc. Do you see how the pioneers talked about the six and 7,000 years? If we, if we skip forward in his writings, we'll see 
how he also realized, uh, I mean how he discovered that someone, that someone had written about this subject before he did, even before the Adventist pioneers. You may wonder, who might that be if there were no Adventists before them? Was it people who, who didn't know the truth and suddenly discovered it? Who were they? Well, we'll see that as we go along. This is the second article, published on July 24th, 1883. He also mentioned some very interesting things here. In our last, numero, in our last number, we spoke of the great week or period of 7,000 years assigned to the history of man. In this number, we wish to enumerate briefly the most important events in the first 2,000 years of this great period. You know what he starts doing? He starts situating the things that happened in the Old Testament, and he starts putting a date on them. That's so that they can be located in time. And he concludes that up to the end of the first thousand years, such and such happens. One, two, three. He, he makes a list. Then he starts with the second thousand years. One, two, three, and other things. He does this millennium after millennium. Look, though, what he says now. The creation of our earth is an event which marks the commencement of this period and which separates time from the eternity of the past. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The act of creation is that which distinguishes God from all other beings and it is because that God is the creator that he has the right to demand that all other beings should worship him. Out of nothing, God created all things. This act marked the commencement of the first day of time. And on that day, he also created the light. Then he starts to talk about the second day. And then he moves up to the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, that it might be an everlasting memorial, that he is the creator of the heavens and of the earth. The first act in man's history is that of rebellion against God. Then God pronounced upon him the sentence of death and expelled him from the Garden of Eden but who suffered that garden with the tree of life to remain for a certain time upon the earth. For he placed a guard cherub and the flaming sword that should prevent man from approaching the tree to eat his fruit. Then he continues advancing through history. He goes on to Cain and Abel and on to Seth. Then he moves forward to the time of the flood. He, he places the flood in the year 1656 after creation, and he goes on to give more and more information. He talks about Noah, and after Noah, well, what he says about Noah is quite interesting, and he goes on for a while about him and things that lead on to future events. After, after talking about Noah and his family and the wicked world surrounding them, he goes on to talk about something more in a third article. The third thousand years must be divided into the period as follows. From the birth of Abraham in the year 2009 till his entrance into the promised land was well, 75 years. He's situating us and keeps moving us forward. He, he talks about Abraham and Terah. Then he talks about Moses and the Hebrews in Egypt. He moves on to Samuel, Solomon, after King David, the 12 tribes, and several other things. Let's look at what he says here. Alexander the Great overthrew the Persian Empire 331 years before Christ, or about 3,789 years after the creation. Keep that date in mind. The Jews made their first alliance with the Romans 161 years before Christ, about the year 3,959. Did you know the Jews had made an alliance with the Romans? It's not, it's not a well-known fact. This was the commencement of the ascendancy of the Romans over the Jews. This covenant with the Romans was renewed 20 years later, about the year 3,980. And out of this relation with the Romans came great trouble to the Jews and their final ruin. The alliance between the Jews and Romans may therefore be said to mark the end of the 4,000 years from the creation of the world. 
this information is interesting. We'll, we'll follow up on this information at a later date and start to unravel it because it'll show us how long, how it became the Roman Catholic Church. You're thinking Jews, Romans? That's pretty big stuff. One day we'll break it down for you. Notice how now we're starting the fourth article, and it keeps talking about the same subject. He situates us in another millennium. He keeps giving us information. But now regarding whose time? Julius Caesar. And who else shows up on the scene? After Julius Caesar and Herod and Caesar Augustus, we start to find ourselves in the time of Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ when he appears in the history of mankind after his birth in Bethlehem. Our Lord Jesus Christ was born in the 33rd year of Herod or about the year 4,115 from creation. His birth did not begin to be regarded as an epoch from which we reckon time until about the year 532 when Dionysius Exegus introduced the custom. It's interesting. We were talking about this subject in one of the conferences I mentioned. We, we were talking about Dionysius Exegus, how he changed the calendar, and why that way of reckoning time was introduced based on the birth of Jesus. Did you know, though, that Dionysius Exegus, the guy who invented the new calendar, and, and said that it was the Christian era as of the year zero when Jesus was born? Well, I'll tell you something. They scored two of the biggest points ever scored with that move. Jesus, of course, wasn't born in the year zero because there's no such thing as the year zero. At any rate, Jesus was born between four and five years before the year calculated as zero. That obviously changes completely the calculation for the year of creation. We demonstrated all of this in, in the conferences we gave. We didn't give them just because we had nothing better to do. The changes to the calendar were made under the express orders of a pope to change the calendar so we would lose track of counting the 6,000 years of the history of mankind. Why, why was there this ill-intentioned interest in changing this? What do you think? However, it wasn't the only one and it wasn't the first one. Somebody had already changed the calendar before that time. Do you know who, who did it? The Jews themselves. Most of the Jewish people had a mistaken approach, a mistaken approach regarding the dates because they knew that, that when 6,000 years of history had been reached, the Messiah would come. But they also knew that the Messiah would come for the first time in the year 4,000. Never, nevertheless, they rejected him. That's why they changed the calendar. So people couldn't expect the exact times that God had set out for the fulfillment of each thing. Even modern day Jews are counting the dates that were put in place not that long ago, in the year 5076 from the time of creation. They've been off the mark for a long time. And then we'll see when the real 6,000 years of history will be fulfilled. It's very clear right now, we are not in the year 5,776. Thank God there are some people who are able to calculate the real year we're in, and they were able to demonstrate it. There are some Jews who use the correct calendar. It's the calendar that William Miller and Ellen White base their calculations on. They're a minority group of Jews who are despised by other Jews. They're called the Karaites. Does that name sound familiar to you? Well, I'll tell you something. With their help, we're going to be able to help start understanding a few things that until now we were ignorant of. And thank God, we can now demonstrate something that is crucial for each of us here and for everyone else in the world. Look now how Andrew starts talking about Christ and he begins to situate him 
after he finishes talking about Dionysus and the things about him, he mentions, the slaughter of the children at Bethlehem was therefore about two years before the commencement of our era, when Christ was, about, was 12 years of age. And in the eighth year of our era, he went up to Jerusalem. That's Luke 2.42. John the Baptist began to preach in the year 26, or about 4,146 from creation. The Savior was baptized and commenced his ministry when he was about 30 years old in the autumn of the year 27. And that's Luke 3.23. When he commenced his ministry, he said, the time is fulfilled. If Jesus said, the time is fulfilled, it must be because there was a time set for, for, for fulfillment. Wouldn't that be right? It's obvious. Mark 1, 14 and 15. This must therefore mark the end of the 69 weeks which were to extend to the Messiah, the Prince. That's Daniel 9, 25. And pay special attention here. Because we'll see again in the conference that this comes after this one, and it's the key to understanding everything. Now, this is not something Ellen White is writing. J. N. Andrews is writing this. Christ was crucified in the spring of 31. After preaching three years and a half, this was in accordance with the prophecy of Daniel 9.27, that he should be crucified in the midst of the 70th week. The death of Stephen in the commencement of the first persecution is placed by eminent chronologists in the year 34, or 4,154, from the creation. The following year, Saul was converted. The Council of the Apostles assembled at Jerusalem was in the year 52, or about the year of the world, or in the world, 4,172. So you're thinking, well, how did he calculate all of that? We'll see this little by little. There's also something quite interesting here. Look at the last phrase, and we'll link it to the text that's been translated and highlighted. In the year 60 of the Christian era, or 4,180 years after the creation, St. Paul wrote his epistle to the Romans. In it, he uses these remarkable words. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. That's Romans 13, 12. The period of the fallen state of man is represented in the Bible as night. And the coming of Christ and the resurrection of the just is spoken of as introducing the morning. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 8, Isaiah 21, 11 and 12, Psalm 49, 14, 2 Peter 1, 19. We have learned that this night extending from the fall of Adam to the coming of Christ in glory is about 6,000 years in duration. Those are quite the deductions, aren't they, that he's reaching? He and the Adventists in general. We'll also see that there's a small point in what he's mentioning where there's something very small and subtle. And thank God and Ellen White, who was inspired by the Lord, to see it. It's the cornerstone of everything. Now, he continues going through the New Testament period. He tells us the story of how the, the Catholic Church begins to come into play. I'll skip some of it, but we can, we can go into all of this further another day. You can, you can get more information on our webpage called The Great Deception. But then he starts discussing a series of nations that came into being based on what was already, had already been prophesied. They're the countries that evolved from tribes in the north of Europe and have ended up being modern-day Europe. So let's look at the fifth article, because he continues dis discussing the sixth period of a thousand years from the, from the creation commenced near the end of the ninth century of the Christian era. He goes on to discuss some popes and what they did. And then he presents what? He presents the entire system of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. He also begins to elaborate on the Jesuits. That's truly interesting, isn't it? We, get, we give a conference on the fascinating subject of the Jesuits. If you don't know about them, you're likely to become trapped in the jaws of Rome. There is one aspect that I think we should investigate further, though. 
Have you ever heard of the Cathars? No? Have you read The Great Controversy by Ellen White? <clears throat> Have you? If you haven't read it, I recommend you start doing so right away. But read it carefully. Don't just scan it to get the gist. No, no, no. Read it thoroughly. Because Ellen White speaks of the Cathars as a people who lived in France, who had to seek refuge in the Pyrenees Mountains, quite near to where I live. They were exterminated by the power of the Vatican. Oddly enough, Ellen White refers to them as good men, just like there were the Albigensians. It's interesting that the history that we have received via official sources is that the Cathars were practically satanic in nature. It, it said that they used spiritism and a bunch of weird things. Let's see what Andrew says here. Dr. Alex says that the Cathars of this century kept the seventh day. And Mosheim says the same thing of the Pasaginians of this century. Before, he mentioned Peter Waldo. He was the founder of the Waldensians. Do you remember them, right? They also kept the Sabbath, and they ended up badly except for a few of them who accepted Sunday as the Sabbath and then made an alliance with Rome. Their current day descendant is none other than the current Pope, Francis. He's a descendant of the Waldensians. That's funny, isn't it? The Cathars kept the Sabbath just like others did. Do you really think that someone who keeps a Sabbath could be satanic when they were following what God had said? Moreover, they were Christians, not Jews. That means that history has been man manipulated due to the interests of the Vatican and that has taught a series of ideas to the world or, to, or in high school to college students which aren't true. It's been said that in the it's always said that conquerors write history. And what history will they write? Well, the one that suits them. That's the big difference, difference between the world in general and the Jews in Bible times, the Hebrews. They wrote exactly what happened, and they, they, weren't afraid, they weren't afraid to portray the story of King David with all his serious sins that he, as their king, committed. That's the big difference. The Bible is clear on the good, the bad, and the ugly. Other world historians, however, when referring to nations, have always portrayed their side as the good guys. Everyone else was, ooh, he's so bad. You can see how well biblical inspiration worked, that's for sure. Well, that bit of information was worth mentioning. Andrews continues to the, the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, when, when Napoleon and the French Revolution appear on the scene. He also explains some very, some very odd time periods. There's some information that even Catholics don't usually know about, if they're not priests or something like that. Look, in 1804, was instituted the British and Foreign Bible Society. And after that, goodbye. In 1816, the American Bible Society was instituted. In 1826, the American Temperance Society was formed. In 1831, the British and Foreign Temperance Society was formed. Over, and he, this occurred in, uh, over a vast, tor vast territory. But this is what had been prophesied. In 1848, the people of Rome established a republic and the Pope fled to the King of Naples. In 1854, the Pope proclaimed the Immaculate Conception of Mary. In 1854, before that, they had, yes, venerated the Virgin, but they didn't believe that the Virgin Mary had been conceived immaculately. What does immaculate mean? That she had been born without sin, just like Jesus. So, according to them, who is she comparable to? This is all related to the nature of Christ. Did you know that many preachers, and I mean even very high up and well-known Adventist preachers who, who talk about how 
they talk about how Jesus' nature, when he was born, was like Adam's after he'd sinned. They take the concept of the nature of Christ as one tending to lean towards evil and to sin. But brethren, that's not the truth. No, sir. He had over his body 4,000 years of sin in the human genome. However, he was born, and Ellen White describes it as something superior to his contemporaries or the other people of his time. And he had a, a sculpted body like a gymnast. He stood head and shoulders above the rest. But what else? He was born without sin. And as Ellen White clearly said, and it's obvious when you analyze it, he did not tend towards evil. He was born the same as Adam was before he sinned. I don't know why there is this bent to, to take Jesus as if he were exactly the same as us in every way. Well, he was like us, but not the same as us. How many of you were conceived with the Holy Spirit as your father? Anyone here? My father was called Domingo San Vicente Gomez. And you, you guys, you all know your father's names, don't you? Was the Holy Spirit your father? Jesus had a divine father and a human mother. That's why it's so crucial to acknowledge, like Ron Wyatt, after discovering and analyzing Jesus' blood, they discovered that there were, there were only chromosomes from the mother's side. There were the 23 maternal chromosomes, but there was only one paternal chromosome. The Y chromosome that determines the baby is male. How is that going to be exactly the same for us? Let's look at another question. Everyone here, except for the kids, have had kids, right? What happens with a kid? When he or she starts growing, they reach the stage known as the terrible twos. They have temper tantrum because they don't want to eat and they have a little toy. The first thing they want when another kid wants it from them is they say, no, it's mine. And they hit the other child. Yes or no, is that what happens? All children do that. Why? Because it's a natural process that every human goes through. Then obviously the sense of selfishness that by the way, it is a good, is that a good tendency or a bad tendency? Do you think Jesus went through the same phase? Ellen White said he never gave even the slightest problem to his parents because everything about him was good. Well, please. It's about time that those eminent preachers who everyone follows as if they were divine realize that they're teaching doctrinal er errors that will always have consequences because, because one error leads to another like a chain reaction and in the end it only leads to evil. It's about time that we, we call a spade a spade and people, instead of watching preachers on the internet all the time, should spend their time reading their Bibles and the writings of Ellen White and based on that, draw their own conclusions because we're all grown-ups here. It's about time that we were brave enough to ask God for the wisdom to seek things out for ourselves. If you think I'm saying something that is untrue, tell me. But it's about time that we call a spade a spade. Okay, so here he continues with the subject at hand. And finally, he mentions the sixth and last article. He gives a specific reference to the day of judgment. L look what he says. It was not, therefore, inconsistent that the day of judgment should be appointed for innocent beings. And it was highly proper that the time of that event should be indicated to our first parents in their innocence. We think that God chose a period of six days, such as are known to man, for the work of creation, in order to represent to man that in six days of 1,000 years each, days such as are known to God, he would accomplish the period assigned to man before the judgment. 2 Peter 3, 7 and 8. That the great week of 7,000 years was indicated by the first week of time has been the judgment of many of the wisest and best of men for the period of more than 2,000 years. 
You can see that Andrews wasn't making anything up here or, or anywhere else that he spoke of a period of six or 7,000 years. He knew that ancient wise men had said these things. But check this out. There are still many people who tell me this has all been made up. How illiterate can one be? What ignorance? And worst of all, willfully so. If you leave your prejudices behind, you'll be able to discern these things. Do you know what Ellen White said? Man's worst enemy are his preconceived ideas and prejudices. They make it so that the truth and new light that God is demonstrating is denied because, because there are prejudices against it. We've grown up with ideas that we've been inculcated with. Most times we think they're true. But then we realize that things go far beyond what we've been told and what we had convinced ourselves was true. This, this is where the person who truly desires to know the truth, but because of their accursed pride, is going to lose out because they reject the opportunity God has given them, all because of prejudices. Andrew continues giving more information. What else does he explain to us regarding the end of that era for the return of Christ? Up to now, he's based his ideas on one day being like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. He also talks about the Sabbath in reference to the same subject. He talks about the Sabbath and Jewish festivals, the phases of the moon, and a lot of other things. He also mentions something that the Jews did based on a divine command. It had to do with the cultivation of the land. Every seven years, they had to leave the land fallow and let it rest. But he tells us something else here. He speaks of periods of weeks of seven years, of seven weeks of seven years. In other words, 49 years. And what came after the 50th year? The Jubilee. He said that the Jubilee referred to the exact same thing. The period of the return of Christ, as does the Sabbath, and leaving the land fallow, and one day being a thousand years, and a thousand years being like a day. That's how Mr. J. N. Andrews finishes. He tells us about the end of all the things, how the second death will consume evildoers, how a new heaven and new earth will be created in which the righteous will dwell eternally, and God will be there all in all. This will all take place, of course, at the end of the period of 7,000 years. When finally, the year 7,000 begins, and what will happen? What will happen? The destruction of evildoers. And what happens after that? Eternity without any evil that will last forever. So, I just wanted to show you from these texts that Victor Son Vicens isn't making anything up. They, they, they may tell you uh, I'm a false prophet or a devilish creature, or I don't know how many other things they've called me, or, or they say that I burn Ellen White's books and other out, outlandish things. But I'll, I'll say it again. It's about time we started looking up things for ourselves. Remember, we all have a brain, and we all have our personal relationship with God to know how to discern if everything I've said here is true and from God or not. A quote by Ellen White to keep in mind. This quote can be found in her book, The Desire of Ages, in the chapter 3, The Fullness of Time. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. When did he come? When the time was fulfilled. Before or after? Just at the moment when the time was fulfilled. The Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. But the fulfillment of the promise tarried. Look what he says. Did it really tarry? Well, under their perception, yes. It all seemed far away from them. They thought their son was going to be the redeemer of the world, but it turns out he wasn't. 
He was the first person who committed murder, actually. But does that mean that God delayed his promise, as some people understand the word delay? No. He has his timetable completely established, and things happen when the time is fulfilled, not a minute before and not a minute after. Those who first received it died without the sight. From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriarchs and prophets, keeping alive the hope of his appearing, and yet he came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent, but not, not all rightly interpreted the message. Century after century passed away, and the voices of the prophets ceased. The, the hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel, and many were ready to exclaim, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth. What are a lot of people saying these days? Ha, huh, my grandparents used to say that Jesus was coming, and we're still here. That's right. Many people are saying that. They're expressing the same thought as this quote from the book of Ezekiel. The thing is that before, the prophecy was completely understood. And but the same thing is happening now. But like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste, no haste and no delay. They don't come early and they don't come late. They come exactly when it's their time to do so because God is a God of order, exactness and preciseness. He's mathematical. He doesn't do half-baked things. Now you'll understand why people say, they say, okay, there will be 6,000 years of history and Jesus will return. But maybe he'll come before that. Or maybe he'll come after that. That's not the God I serve because my God is an exact God. Through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking firmest, God had revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel in Egypt and had declared that the time of their sojourning should be 400 years. He always says things beforehand, doesn't he? Afterward, he said, shall they come out with great substance? Against that... Uh, on the selfsame day, appointed in the divine promise, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt, not a day before and not a day after. So, in heaven's council, the hour for the coming of Christ had been determined. So, what, what is a council made up of? Is it just one person? So, who is part of this council being referred to? the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So why did Jesus say when he was on earth that he didn't know the day or the time or, or even the angels in heaven didn't know? How can that add up? Have you, have you ever thought of this idea? We'll, we'll see the explanation of this as we go along because there is an explanation for this. Maybe once again we'll have to get rid of some of our prejudices so that we can understand this idea better. When the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. If he knew when he was going to send him, don't you think he knew everything that was going to happen afterwards? If God is God, and Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, how are they not going to know what the Father knows? Are they lesser gods? What, when, we think that, when you think that Jesus couldn't know the time when he's going to return is an incorrect interpretation. If not, it's like saying that Jesus is a lesser deity created or brought into existence by God the Father like Catholics and many others say. We'll have to begin to unravel all of this to discover the truth. If not, we'll be trading one bad interpretation for another. Let's take a short break now. Then we'll, we'll plunge into the rest of this conference. I'm telling you, you'll see things that Andrew said 
And when I first started doing these conferences, I had no idea that our pioneers besides Ellen White had referred to these things. Thank God. He's teaching us things and showing us so that we can show it to Adventists and to the rest of the world.